Okay, welcome to session five. Anybody glad to be here? And in and, and, and this session, we're going to be turning Wendy loose more. Yes. Yeah. It's titled A Transform Life Accessing the Supernatural. And, and to, to start it off, I wanted to read another excerpt out of Let's Just Laugh at That. And let's just laugh at this lie. A curse is more powerful than a blessing. <laughs> Here's some laughable assumptions behind that lie. Darkness is more powerful than light. <laughs> Though Satan is defeated, his curses are victorious. <laughs> Generational curses are more powerful than generational blessings. <laughs> uh, let's give an extra laugh now. <laughs> if we are cursed, we should worry about bad coming to us. But if we are blessed, we should not expect outrageously good things to come to us. Ha ha ha. Ha ha ha. A spoken blessing isn't really powerful. It's just a courtesy gesture when someone sneezes. <laughs> Christ's work on the cross is easily overturned by a curse. Woo, woo, woo. It's a rough crowd here. You know, when we were on staff in Northern California in the 80s, a, a group of witches came and, and drew a pentagram on our church and cursed our church. And, and we, were, we were very concerned and very worried. Here, here is our thinking. This is what we believed. We believed that if we didn't do something to stop the effects of that curse that was released, bad things were going to happen to us. And we kind of imagined, you know, what might happen. You know, the church burning down. You know, just uh, finances falling apart, people getting sick. And, and you know, it was interesting in that time that that was our belief system. And, and at the same time, if, if the pastor would bless us, we would yawn. Oh, pastor, uh, could you please hurry up with that blessing? You know, I mean, uh, you kind of took a little long in the sermon. And, uh, and so the Lord said, you know, why, why did we have more faith in a witch's curse than in a pastor's blessing? Now, reason, reason for that is because we had renewed our mind with lies, thinking they were true. Yeah. You know, we, we had heard this, we had heard that, you know, we hadn't heard very much about people uh, coming under the influence of a blessing. <laughs> But we had heard a lot about people coming under, underneath a curse. And so Wendy you know, introduced, uh, shared with you the game in the last session that, that we enjoy playing. It's the let's just worry with God game. And so you know, if, we, if, if we get blessed, we're sitting out there like you are, or you're watching, and, and someone would, would bless us, we would turn to each other. One of us would say, I'm worried. <laughs> I'm worried. We just got blessed. If we don't do something to stop the effects of that blessing, it's going to overtake us. I don't know if we're ready to handle it. What if we get so healthy and so much energy from that blessing that we forget to go to sleep? What, what if, because of that blessing, uh, our, our healing ministry grows so much that we can't even leave the, our home without wearing a mask? <laughs> Where are we going to get the mask? <laughs> yeah, and what if, because of that blessing, money starts rolling in so fast that we can't even keep up with it? 
and, and, and we're going to have to hire somebody to keep track. Who are we going to hire? <laughs> and what if, what if, because of that blessing, Wendy, if you and I are sitting out in, you know, in, in the congregation, and uh, because of that blessing, that, that we, our emotional love for each other just grows so much that we can no longer concentrate on the speaker. <laughs> I mean, I, I'm, I'm worried. I am too. <laughs> I'm worried. <laughs> we, we actually, when God started talking to us about understanding the power of a blessing, you know, in the Old Testament, they understood it, and that was under an inferior covenant. And uh, so when he started talking to us about having more faith in a blessing than in a curse, we actually started to fake sneeze because people would say, bless you. <laughs> and remember, in the Old Testament, Jacob lied to get a blessing. <laughs> it was so valuable that he deceived pe- his dad to get that blessing. That's how much value he had for that blessing. And it just really is so frustrating that we tend to have more faith in a curse than in a blessing. When a, a curse lasts three to four generations and a blessing lasts to a thousand Why are we so busy looking to see what our generational curse is? Shouldn't we be finding out what our generational blessing is? We need to redeem those things. And luckily for some of us, we can go back to a thousand generations because, the, you know, some of our relatives, we may not think they have any blessing to pass on, but um, you get to go way back. Somewhere along the line, there's a generational blessing that you can actually stand on. And you're probably even living out of that you don't know. But you can increase it by coming into agreement with it. So, yeah, you know, the funny thing is, is I asked God once, how come we have more value for a curse than a blessing? And he said, well, because religiously, you... You can see what a, a curse is, but when you try to picture a blessing, it doesn't fit your theology. Hmm. Wow. That's deep. If you don't have a theology that's got, that God is good and wants to have you live in abundance, it's going to be very difficult to be blessed because it involves success in every area of your life. That's what a blessing is. And so if theologically we think we have to earn it, then we're not going to be able to get a blessing. So we've got to do some shifting. One of the things I love to tell people is, have you ever noticed that in a generational curse, I've seen people who have um, like a a blessing of, of favor, you know, whether Christian or not, because generationally they have this favor thing going on. And they may not even be that great of people, but everybody likes them. They keep getting jobs over other people who are steady and faithful just because, you know, they do everything wrong and they still get favor. (laughs) You know, it used to bug me. And then I realized, how come, you know, we don't understand. We're trying to earn stuff. So if you have a spirit of rejection, you can do everything right and you still get rejected. Have you notice that? If you have a spirit of favor, then you can do everything wrong and still be favored. And that's not an excuse to do everything wrong. It just takes the pressure off you to do everything right. It leaves you room to be human or supernaturally human. <laughs> But it just takes that pressure off. Okay, I don't have to do it all right. I have, it's a spirit, not a performance. You can earn favor too, but we don't want just that. 
we want to be blessed with a spirit of favor so that no, no matter what we do, we get favored. And isn't it fun to think, oh, wow, I'm the highly favored one of God. I don't have to do it all right. I'm going to try to, but it's not so much pressure. So if you're under a curse, you can do everything right and it still won't work out. You can do everything right and it still won't work out right. If you're under a blessing, you could do everything wrong and it'll still work out right. I mean, Obed-Edom in 2 Samuel 6 had the Ark of the Covenant parked at his house. He didn't do anything. Just had the Ark. It just ended up there. Many of you know the story. Three months later, Abraham, I mean, excuse me, David heard that Obed-Edom was blessed. I wonder what that blessing looked like. I wonder what he heard. It wasn't a theological blessing. It was actually a literal blessing that was in his experience. And, and, and we've got something greater than the Ark of the Covenant parked in our hearts. And yet I think what Wendy hit on is, is that our blessing doesn't fit seemingly many Christians' theology. And therefore, we're actually in opposition with ourselves. God wants to bless us. And one of Wendy's great quotes that, that I love that she shares is that we're only able to receive what we believe we're worth. And, and, and so if we get blessed beyond what we think we're worth, there's, we'll, there's a tendency to self-sabotage our life to bring our lifestyle back to what we believe we're worth. Most of it is subconscious. It's not thought out, but it's strongholds of the mind. It's strongholds in the spirit of the mind. And, and so many people's lack of walking in blessing is not a stewardship issue, it's not even an ability issue, it, it's a worth issue. It's a worth issue. And so that's why the identity teaching, that's why the revelation of what Jesus has done on the cross is so crucial for us. How many of you know we're worth what was paid for us? It's quite a bit. So thank you, Lord, for... Powerful breakthrough. Just say, I am blessed. I am blessed. By walking in abundant blessings. I walk in abundant blessings. My theology attracts blessing. My theology attracts blessing. Yeah, you know, we've talked about coming into inner agreement, and one of the reasons that became really big for us was I remember years ago noticing that certain people carry more weight and authority when they speak the word or pray for people than other Christians. And I always thought, you know, is that just age or, you know, what? And then started looking, no, it had nothing to do with that either. And um, so I was asking the Holy Spirit, what creates that extra oomph on their words? Because I don't know about you guys, but... Someone can say something exactly like we said it, only it has more power. It used to bother me when we pastored in Nevada and we would have Bill Johnson come in the 90s to speak at our church. And all of our congregation would come up and go, did you hear what he said? That was so good. And we're like, we said that. <laughs> But it didn't penetrate. And then even at one time, we had some people at one of the churches that we pastored that had just come out of New Age. They were kind of new Christians, so they still were kind of living in a little bit of both worlds. And um, they had never seen Bill Johnson, didn't really know anything about him. And uh, he was our guest speaker. And I'm sitting there talking to these sisters, and Bill walks into the room, and they go, who is that? And I'm like, well, that's Bill Johnson, our guest speaker. And they go, oh, he has a really big aura. Because <laughs> he carried something. And so I'm asking the Holy Spirit, what's that? What is that? How do you get that? And he said, the more in unity you are with a belief, the more weight that carries when you speak it. 
when everything within you is lining up with that belief, not just your brain, but your emotions, everything within your body, the more you actually are in unity with it. Because I can remember, I had heard years ago that we couldn't have revival until the church got into unity. That's a kind of a depressing theology. Yeah. Ha, 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 ha. Ha, ha. But, you know, I was going after it, and I was praying, oh, God, just help us get unity in the church. And he just interrupts, and he goes, Wendy, if you would just get into unity with you, I could change the world. <laughs> if we could just get into unity with what we think we believe, really get it deep into the spirit of your mind, because there's something that takes over when you're tired or hungry or stressed out, we want to have such a belief in the core truths of the scripture that no matter what the circumstances, that's what comes out. That belief. And you don't get that by osmosis. It's an intentional decision that this is going to be a core belief of mine that will change everything. Wendy's got such a passion for realizing that the substance that we carry is greater than the substance that's in the world. It's greater than the substance of, of, of the enemy. And, you know, I think one of the transformations of, in your life is just knowing that greater is he that's in us than he that's mm-hmm. in the world. Amen. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I actually had an experience in a... I had gone to a women's group, and there was a woman that she carried a lot of weight in the authority, in the spirit realm, but unfortunately, it was negative. And um, <laughs> so, <laughs> <laughs> it works in the negative. The more you are convinced, like if you're a really, really bitter or angry person, and you, the more your body, emotions, everything is in line with that belief or that emotion the greater weight you carry in changing atmospheres. And so she would come to some of the meetings under such a thing of bitter and anger, and I was a little susceptible to whatever everybody was thinking. And so I went into a meeting one time, and she came in, and it was like, oh, no, it's going to be an awful meeting because she's having one of her days, and she is so powerful that she just brings she's a downer you know you heard people who come into a room and everybody just gets down and um (laughs) so it was early in the morning and I wasn't quite prepared to be you know hit by this spiritual onslaught of what she was carrying so I made up an excuse to run home and get something I didn't need anything except for my peace but um, (laughs) So I, we lived next to the church, and so I was going to the house to regain my peace. And I started to open the door, and I heard the Holy Spirit go, Wendy, the spirit that is in you is greater than he than the, that is in the world. And I'd heard that scripture so many times, but this time when he said it, it was like, oh, you mean that literally? It was... <laughs> <laughs> It was this revelation. And he said, I want you to know what you carry. You carry peace and joy. You carry grace. And I want you to walk back into that room and know that what you carry will influence the room more than what she carries. It's time to understand what you carry. Don't shrink back. Stop coming under what everybody else is under and start radiating what you carry. Just release it in the atmosphere. I don't know about you, but I just was getting really tired of always having my emotions manipulated by what somebody in the room was carrying. And I just decided, if they and their emotions can influence me, why can't I influence them? It only seems fair. (laughs) And saying greater is he that's in you. Exactly. Mm. Light really is greater than darkness. (laughs) So even if you feel like a weakling, 
you probably have more authority to change the atmosphere than they do. Just know what you carry. So many times we're so focused on what we don't have that we forget what we have. Consciously, as soon as, you know, now when I feel stuff in the room, I'm, I'm constantly trying to build that spiritual muscle of, okay, I'm not influenced by that anymore. They're influenced by me. I get to bring peace to that person who is trying, not even trying, they just are bringing chaos. But I can influence. Lead, leaders are, are thermostats, not thermometers. I used to think I, you know, I was spiritual because I could discern what was going on around me. The spiritual yeah, temperature. Yeah, just all, you know, I'd come into a meeting and go, oh, no, there's a spirit of heaviness here. <laughs> oh, I was really wanting to have a good meeting today. <laughs> yeah, let's laugh at that. <laughs> no, you know. I, I'm not called to reflect what's, what's going on. I, I'm, I'm called to influence. I am a thermostat. Yeah. And that's what leaders are. Leader, you don't even have a title. It, it, leaders always think and act above the environments they're yeah. in. And, and they're not afraid of finding negative things in their environments. And it's time, you know, again, the church came out of a season where we were so devil-focused. You know, just uh, we we're afraid things were going to jump on us. And, you know, we, we'd walk by some like an adult bookstore and go, oh, you know, I got, just got slimed. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, just got slimed. On, you know, you know. It's time. It's time that the church, you know, actually believe that, you know, we, that greater is he that's in us, that we walk by an adult bookstore and the people just go, oh, I just got slimed with purity. <laughs> Did you feel that purity? Yeah. <laughs> wow. Yeah. Another thing with that teaching is I used to read, you know, the, <laughs> the scripture that talks about the seven sons of Sceva that went to that guy's house to cast out all those demons, and they said, you know, we cast you out, and then name of Jesus whom Paul preaches. And this one man filled with demons can beat up seven <laughs> men, strip them naked and chase them out of his house. And I used to read that and I would just kind of go, yeah, demon possessed people are powerful. <laughs> <laughs> and then one day I'm reading it and I feel like the Holy Ghost says, you know, Wendy, if one man possessed by demons can do that, what can one man possessed by God do? Yeah. Why weren't we thinking that way? Because you know what possession is? It means a demon lives in you. And who lives in you? Wow. You might be possessed by God. What would happen if we just really grabbed hold of that? What can you do? Why are we so afraid? Wendy, isn't it hard, though, to be anointed? <laughs> He's just... <laughs> In other words, tell my story. Yes, this um, is a good one. <laughs> Years ago, when I was, you know, you just start seeing all these people with this great anointing in their life. They're healing the sick and raising the dead. And I was praying and just begging God, you know, God, I want more of the anointing. I want more of the anointing. And he goes, oh, it's not that hard to be anointed. And I'm like, it's not. I've been doing this for a couple of years, <laughs> begging. And... <laughs> and he goes, no, even a handkerchief can do it. <laughs> And I realized, what's the difference between me and a handkerchief? <laughs> this. And how do handkerchiefs get anointed? They're just in the presence. 
What if you believed you cannot be in his presence without being changed? Wow. Can you be outside in the sun without getting a burn or a tan? You don't go out there working. <laughs> I love the, the terminology of soaking. And I know for me, that probably was one of the biggest life-changing things when I started just sitting in God's presence and started believing, I don't even have to say anything. I'm just going to lay here in your presence. And people started seeing a difference. There was nothing that you could put your hand on. But when you're in his presence, something happens. It's so powerful. That unseen realm is bigger than, than we know. You know, can I share another story? Another thing that really changed my life with this whole thing was I had gotten up in the middle of the night and was waiting to hear why I was up, you know, intercessors, you know, you know what I mean. You're, you know you got woken up for something, but you don't know what. And earlier that day, I had been reading in devotions about the story where Jesus had died and the disciples went into a locked room and Jesus just showed up. So in the middle of the night, I'm sitting out in the living room waiting on God, and Jesus just goes, hey, Wendy, do you know how I got into the locked room? And immediately I started thinking of all the ghost movies I had seen. (laughs) And I said, well, you were dead, and so you were just a spirit, so there's no substance to spirits, and you could walk through walls. And he goes, no, I'm more real than the wall." And my brain just kind of did a little flip. And he continued on and he said, the creator cannot have less substance than what it creates. And why that changed my life was because I had always pictured the spirit realm as having no substance. Even my spirit seemed to have less substance than my body. So it was more powerful than my spirit. But when he said that, what's the part of you that lives forever? The most substantial part is your spirit. And when you think about it, this realm was created by spirit, and it's influenced by spirit. It has to be. Jesus said, my words are spirit And they are life. That's why they're powerful, because spirit influences what it created. What if we really understood that we are spirit? And that it has substance. It's not just, you know, ooh, something you can, you know, float through walls. It has substance to shift things. And when we start attaching faith to spirit more than flesh, especially your own body, we have to stop thinking that this is the reality. It is real, but it's not the reality. It's fun. (laughs) It kind of used to bother me that we would get people born again of the spirit and then tell them to stay out of the spirit realm. (laughs) Has that not bothered you? What did I need a spirit for? He doesn't live in us because he needs a home. He's in us to manifest. And if he's not manifesting, you know, in the 80s, we thought if anything was supernatural, it was Satan. Anything that happened supernaturally had to be Satan. Like God's not supernatural. Ha ha. I don't, you know. Ha ha ha. These are some of the things that we don't realize that they're unknown lies and perceptions that have limited us and made us feel less than. 
you know, as pastors, we used to go to pastors' meeting, and we would wonder, you know, why the pastors would complain about their people. They're not doing anything. They just sit in their pews, and, you know, we were kind of like, well, you just told them that they're powerless and sinners. Why would they do something? <laughs> they were just getting what they were teaching them. I think we need to start teaching people how powerful they are. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. It's time for the demons to be afraid of us. Yeah. I think some of our, you know, the season of, of, of being, having more faith in Satan's ability to deceive us than the Holy Spirit's ability to lead us made us as Christians almost like we had a spiritual straitjacket on. I, I don't want to do anything. I can't do anything even slightly weird <laughs> because of our fear of being deceived. And, and many, many, many realities, you know, that even non-Christians have tapped into some realities of the spirit because the church was afraid of it. And I know just the, the whole journey of, of just having faith in the supernatural. I know one of the, the, the stories of, of just even Wendy's journey of, of, of how she actually even speaks in front of people. When we got saved, it was, um, we, I don't know how long it was afterwards, maybe three months, six months afterwards, we were asked, or a group of us, about 10 to 15 had gotten saved at the same time. And we were asked to go to a church of about 20 people and give a five-minute testimony of, of, of our getting saved. And I remember that day, I mean, I fasted all day. <laughs> I didn't eat a thing because, man, my, I, I was so nervous about giving my five minutes. I mean, my, I fasted all day, prayed, sought God, grabbed the horns of the altar <laughs> in prayer because my goal was survival. My goal was, I hope I don't make a fool out of myself, giving my testimony. Aren't you glad God works with us where we're at? Yes. He sees the big picture, and we may feel like such a failure, but he's leading us somewhere. And, and, and I know Wendy, Wendy's story in that is, is, is equally interesting. Yes. <laughs> I was really, really shy and timid growing up, and uh, I avoided all public speaking, even in classrooms, whatever it took. And so, but I was going to, you know, you know, submit myself and give my testimony. And I stood up in front of the 20 people, looked at them, started crying, sat down, and said, I will never speak in public again. Yep, and now let's laugh about it. <laughs> there is a couple different things that set me free in that. One is God said, you, cannot, you can no longer keep visualizing yourself in your past failures in public speaking. You have to start seeing yourself as a successful public speaker. But the thing that really set me free was years ago. This was in the 90s before... Pastor Bill Johnson was really seeing all the stuff that's happening now. He would come to our church, and he would dream. And he said, there's coming a day where the anointing is going to be so strong that all you have to do is say peanut butter, and people will go, what must I do to be saved? <laughs> and when he said that, something in me said, I can do that. I can say peanut butter. <laughs> And he said, what he revealed to me was that I had more faith in my ability. He said, you, instead of having faith in your ability to speak, why don't you have faith in my ability to anoint what you say? Say it again, Wendy. Instead of having faith in your ability to speak, why don't you have faith in my ability to anoint what you say? And that's just not for just public speaking. That's for counseling. That's for praying. That's for, you know, having the right word of wisdom to 
bring something to a room, is it really what you say or is it the anointing that's on what you say? Have you ever seen, I've heard of little children being asked to pray for a sick person and they go, bless this food. (laughs) (laughs) And the person gets healed. (laughs) (laughs) And it's like, you didn't say it correctly. (laughs) We get so hung up over, you know, because that was my big hang up. I'll get up there and I'll forget what I was going to say and I'll stumble over my words and I might say it wrong and, you know, scar somebody for life. And um, (laughs) and then I just decided, you know what, I'm going to make God bigger than me. Hmm. And fear of making a mistake is making God too small to fix it. What can he use? Give him something to work with. It's powerful in, in watching what's happened in Wendy's life through the years, just break, getting that truth. That truth, of saying, she said, I can say peanut butter when she got something flipped. And, and, and we, we just say, thank you, Lord, what you're doing here. Let's, let's laugh at this lie. If, if you don't say everything just perfectly, you cannot be effective. Ha, 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 Let's give an extra laugh at that. Ha, 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 ha. And so the, the substance... When you start thinking about this, and and we're we're gonna close with this, when you start thinking about impartation, impartation's one of the most amazing things. Mm -hmm. I mean, in in Deuteronomy 34, verse nine, it says, Joshua had wisdom because Moses laid his hands on him. Somebody just go, hmm, (laughs) hmm. Anybody like shortcuts? I mean, I love shortcuts. I love finding a way, you know, that, wow, I can get there easier. And here's the, the, there was something that happened there. There's a supernatural thing. Moses believed he had something he could give away. Joshua believed he could receive something. It's supernatural. Yeah. It's supernatural. And, 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 and he didn't work for it. He didn't earn it. It just happened. There's another great verse in Romans 1.11. Paul says to the Romans, I long to be with you that I may impart to you a spiritual gift so that you may be established. He said, there's something I can do in person that I can't do in a letter. There's there's a spiritual dynamic that's happening. And and I believe even in in these meetings and and, uh, those watching the video, that there's a supernatural dynamic of impartation that's happening, that's establishing you. And literally, Wendy and I are not speaking to your minds. We're not, we're not just saying, well, I hope these people can get it. Let's <laughs> laugh at that. <laughs> it's way beyond that. It's way beyond that. We actually believe you being in this environment, you watching these messages, literally that, that God's doing something, he's bypassing your mind. Say, that's good news. I just want to share another testimony. When we were pastoring our first place that we pastored, I realized we needed something more than we had, and I used to go to the church at night and pray, and I felt compelled to just yell freedom over and over and over again. And so it went on for months. I would just walk around the sanctuary saying, freedom, freedom. And nobody knew, you know, I was doing that. But a few months later, a guest speaker came in, and he walked in, and when he came up front to speak, he didn't, I don't think we even really knew him that well. I don't know where he came from. (laughs) But he goes, when I walked in here this morning, I heard the word freedom. Yes. Yes. (laughs) My words are spirit, and they are life. 
and they will not fall to the ground until they perform that which it was sent to do. It was still floating through the air until it had performed what it was supposed to do. Even, I love, at the very first session this, that we did, Steve made a comment about um, Elizabeth and, and Zachariah and the angel saying, your prayer has been heard and you're going to have a baby. I mean, they were old. They weren't praying that anymore. <laughs> 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 right? <laughs> it's not like they prayed for 50 years and finally God heard them. They had probably stopped for 30 years. But their prayer didn't fall to the ground. It's still impacting. Wow. What do we carry? When we speak the word of God, it's spirit and life. It's so much more powerful. Let's laugh at this lie. (laughs) If you don't understand perfectly everything Wendy and I are saying, (laughs) it's... These truths aren't going to work for you then. (laughs) 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 We believe we have more faith in the impartation and the supernatural of what God's imparting than whether you're actually understanding every little thing. And and we, we bless you. We release over you powerful impartation of victorious mindsets, of of abounding hope, of unreasonable optimism, uh, of of joy, the joy of the Lord being your strength, breaking off your agreement with past experience and agreeing with God. We release impartation on all of that. And we release impartation of uh, of you accessing the spirit realm like never before. Why don't you just say, say the word freedom. freedom. Say, say breakthrough. breakthrough. Say no limits. no limits. You receive this word, say I receive it. I receive it. I'll never be the same again. Give God thanks and praise. Thank you.